Okay, hopefully I can teach you something about aspidistras. I was actually finding it difficult to learn things about it myself. There's not a lot of information out there, uh, I have to say, but I did a little bit of digging, and um, so I'm hoping you all know what an aspidistra is, which um, uh, Alexander has been pointing out a couple of them uh, while you've been waiting uh, uh, online, you were seeing them as the background shots. Uh, so the most common one though is the cast iron planter uh, Aspidistria ladier. And that's probably the one you may have in your own garden or in your house, but there's more than that one. And so uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them, uh, the plants in general, and we'll get you some more specifics and a couple of funny or fun facts about some of them too, I guess you might say. Um, so, uh, we'll see what else, and then I'll get in a little bit of specifics on a few that we actually have here in our collection, whether in our greenhouse or out in the garden, and say tell you some that might be really good to try in your own yard or in your house. So anyways, I like phylogenies or plant, how plants are related or interrelated, and um, Dennis, uh, who uh, works in our... Um, or you've seen him speak about Aspidistra last month, I believe. Uh, he mentioned to me this morning, have you looked up anything about what they're related to? And it's like, darn, I hadn't done that because I was trying to think of what to talk about. And so uh, after lunch, I actually quickly did a little bit of uh, research and, uh, to find out. I, I knew that they were now being lumped into a family called the Asparagaceae. Asparagaceae, which I'm hoping you all know what that is, the asparagus family. Um, it's hasn't been around that long. I'm gonna guess within the last 20 to 30 years they came up with this family and it's even a order, the Asparagale, uh, going even up higher than that now. And it used to, everything was lumped into the Liliaceae and a few other, other nondescript families. Um, but they've split out a whole bunch of the stuff from the Liliaceae and threw it into this, uh, or the, the Liliaceae and threw it into the Asparagaceae and consolidated several other families. So am, am, I, vis am I being heard? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so anyways, so just to give you some background on that, so within the Asparagaceae, there's like seven or eight different subfamilies. Um, to get even deeper into this, so we're doing deeper in the garden. Um, so um, some of the families or subfamilies within the Asparagaceae are the, the Agavoidae, the Brodiae, the uh, Lo Lomandrioidae, the Cilioidae, the Aphyloidae uh, or something like that. And of course the Asparaga uh, Asparaga uh, Asparagoidae. And then there's the Nolineae. Does anybody know what a Al Nolina is? You probably, you, you think if you know this, this is, you might be from the Southwest. We do have some here in the garden, Nolinas and Dazzlerians, uh, which are very closely related in reality to the Aspidistra. Um, but they're within a, I don't know how it goes, but a sub, sub family, I guess you'd say, um, uh, within some of the, um, um, within the Nolinoidae, I can't spit these all out. All this Latin, um, but anyways, so um, within the Nolioidae, there are uh, about oh, another six sub sub families, uh, and in this case, the uh, Aspidistra belongs to the Convalar Convalarioidae. So, does anybody know what Convalaria is? If you grew up in the north like I did, I loved Convalaria. Um, actually made an arrangement for my cousin's uh, wedding out of totally Convalaria, which is Lily of the Valley. Uh, so that's one you might know. Um, that's, uh, that's the same sub sub family or formerly the, uh, the same family that included um, the Aspidistra. Other things that are in that same family that you may or may not know are Spirantha, which is really similar to the Convalaria. Rhodia, which a lot of people grow around here. Uh, we have several different ones in the garden, and actually there's one right over there uh, in particular, real close to me. Uh, and then uh, Tupistra, which is similar to Rhodia. Um, but other things that are in the more distant relatives of those are the Solomon seals, like polyg uh, Polygonatum, uh, uh, so, polyg uh, which is the polygonae, uh, polygon 
polygonante, uh, spit out all the right syllables, ophiopogone, which is your ophiopogons and uh, liriope, so li your lily turfs, your monkey grass, whatever you want to call it, those are distant relatives. In your house, you may have a Sansevera, which is in, now lumped, I believe, into Dracaena, which is in the Draciniae. Draciniae, I think that's how you say it. And if you're like us here at the garden and you have other obscure plants that are in the same family, you might have ruscus in your garden, the butcher's broom, which is ruscae, 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 yes. And so those are some of their cousins, <laughs> which I wouldn't have thought about, uh, at least the Nolina side of things uh, being that closely related. Some of these other shade tolerant ones, entirely understand. So that gives you a tiny bit of the background higher up um, than the uh, just the genus Aspidistra. So back to Aspidistra itself. So Aspidistra has been somewhat neglected for a long time uh, botanically, that is the study of it. And so up until uh, the late 70s, they accepted about eight or 10 different species, include, which included um, Eladier, for instance, which has been grown for a, quite some time, as you'll find out. But today, um, so in the last well, 40 years or so, um, they've upped that to over 200 species of Aspidistra have been recognized, uh, and they're still finding more. Um, Aspidistra, the genus itself, is typically found in Southeast Asia. So southern China, um, well, let me see, I have a whole list of the countries just so I can remember. Um, so uh, the Eastern Himalayas, Hainan Island, um, which is part of China, Japan, Laos, uh, Malay, so the Malay Peninsula going down into Malaysia into uh, maybe um, uh, Sumatra, I'm not sure 100% on that part, Myanmar or Burma, whatever you want to say, Taiwan, um, Thailand, and Vietnam are the where they're native to. So um, it's all there in the Southeast Asia part. So uh, they're all pretty uh, tightly packed in there. They are pretty regionally specific. There are some that are have fairly wide distributions, but a lot of them just a tiny area that they are found in. So that's uh, why they're, I think, finding so many more species now. They're really getting into those areas and um, uh, collecting and doing research and finding that they, these are actually new species. So, um, so that's the basis on uh, those is right there, you know. Um, the, the species in general, but a lot of them are tropical, subtropical. They'll take our conditions here. I laugh when I was reading, um, uh, a lot of the information comes out of England uh, and, and Great Britain, Europe in general too. Uh, and they say how hardy these things are. And they say for a lady or um, that uh, it's hardy to about, uh, I think it was negative four Celsius, which I guess translated to something like 28 Fahrenheit. 28 Fahrenheit. We don't get that. We don't get below 28 Fahrenheit here, right? This, this, that's why this Aladier looks so good here. Uh, we never get below 28. Uh, even on our warm winters, we get down below 20 typically. So um, they go to zero for us more or less. So um, for the most part on the uh, Eladier types, which are your common um, cast iron plants that everyone probably has. Um, so the information's always a little bit, you have to uh, do your own tests sometimes. And so some of the plants that we think might not be hardy, we might find later on that are actually hardy here, but there are some that are truly not hardy here. Uh, a lot of tropicals, which I can show you a few of those later on uh, that we have been keeping in our nursery right now. So um, uh, let's see. So you might ask, how do uh, Aspidistra reproduce? That's something, it's a big question. Um, and pollinators, because that's a big deal nowadays, are pollinators, they have very little clue as to what pollinates an Aspidistra. They have surmised that things called amphipods, which are just tiny little itty bitty things in the soil, um, little crust, uh, uh, arthropods, um, so uh, that are in the soil might be one of the things that actually pollinate them. They're not certain. Could also be certain kinds of flies, tiny flies in particular. Uh, some of the fruit fly uh, uh, might be the cause for them to be pollinated. Um, also some midge type of midges uh, might be another thing that pollinates them. They actually know of some midges that lay their eggs in the flowers and their larvae eat the pollen, but they don't know if they're truly pollinating them or not. 
So, um, and the draw for the pollinator is of question. Who knows what's drawing them? They say there's no nectar. The flowers, at least to human senses, have little, if any at all, fragrance, so there's no draw there. The flowers, uh, like some flowers that are bee pollinated, for instance, will have um, different wavelengths of light that they give off uh, that we can't see, for instance, and the, well, you know, draw a bee into them. They don't have that on Aspidistra, not that a bee could even find the flowers, which I'll show you an example of a tiny, a couple of flowers here later on, which are strange uh, to begin with. So, um, uh, but the resulting, whatever does pollinate them, it even does it here. We get fruit here in the garden and seed here in the garden. So, uh, and they're not native here. So, um, wait, that goes back to the pollinators. You know, po no, I won't get into that. Uh, native pollinators, it's like only wanting natives. Uh, <laughs> anyways, so. What happens after they are pollinated, you do get a fruit, and I will get some here. Um, actually, I'll show you a giant flower, a couple of giant flowers, uh, first of all. I have my props here. I'm going to set this off to the side. So I don't know. I'm going to set this down on a board so Alexander can point this to you, out to you, but there's a flower right here. This is starting to dry up a little bit. I've uh, dug these the other day when I had a little more time than I did this morning, but um, this is, um, we're not 100% sure what species of Aspidistra this is, but this is one that has a flower of a decent size, not big, but not small either. Um, so they're quite bizarre. And this is more or less where the soil level is, where my hand is. So these are right at soil level or in a duff layer for the most part. There is one species that has flower stalks supposedly about up to eight inches tall. So that's a strange outlier. So um, the flowers are, actually pretty cool to look at, but they're nothing that's gonna jump out at you unless you are crawling around on the ground or have them in a pot uh, up at your eye level. Uh, otherwise, you're not gonna see the flowers. And here I do actually have a really nice fresh flower that I cut just before. And that's actually from this plant right next to me here. Aspidistra uh, um, edmanensis, uh, flowing fountain. So, but I'm gonna put these down here, hopefully in, um, uh, Alexander will maybe want to focus in on these for you to see just a little bit of how bizarre these little things are. Um, there's not much space in there. There's these kind of like a cap on top of the, the flower and then that protects all the pollen that's somewhere down in there and very little minuscule holes that you can get in around it. That's why they're truly not sure what actually could pollinate them. And they haven't seen it. And if you go to dissect the flowers, they only last a few hours before they dry up. Um, even if you put them in water, they will shrivel or put them in alcohol thinking you could preserve them. They won't preserve. So, uh, it, it makes some things a little bit complex. So anyways, uh, here I have some fruit and you'll see them on some of them. This is um, one off of an aladier, but it's not totally ripe. This is one actually probably from last fall. Um, right there, and it's not totally right, but I have another one here that I've cut open. It was a little bit bigger, so you can kind of see what's inside here, maybe. And again, these are a berry, and they can have one to several seeds within the berry. Uh, and these just dry out after they ripen up. And you able to see that then with the, uh, on the screen, Alexander? Okay, cool, I'll put that down here then. And then I have a handful of seeds, uh, which these are off of Eladier. To me, they look like um, someone who went to the dentist and there's a, um, you know, there's a cavity in the middle of this, your tooth and you haven't been brushing enough and they're really yellow. Um, you're drinking too much tea and coffee. Uh, anyway, so these are some seeds um, that I found within the garden. Um, they, I do get seedlings even uh, uh, on rare occasions and actually not too rare, but here's, here's one, a little itty bitty seedling, uh, which I'll put over here as well. Um, so that's actually an or seedling off of uh, um, an unnamed one we have in the garden that came from seed uh, years ago. Predates me uh, being at the Arboretum, but I planted it in 2006. Um, so when it was in the nursery in the patch is really nice now. So that's a little bit of the overview of the flowers and the fruit and the seeds of that and the life cycle, I guess you'd say, of uh, an Aspidistra. So um, 
let's see. Uh, so where do they grow in the wild? Um, they typically grow in shaded areas. And I think I have a picture that I sent to um, Blake here that he can post up. It's actually a picture that Mark took in Taiwan and I believe in Imeishan um, uh, of them growing in a bamboo grove. Uh, so uh, that it's um, Aspidistra attenuata, which I think we have maybe that clone in the in the um, lath house. I did not bring a sample of that one down. It looks very much like Eladia, a little bit more diminutive so far, but um, it is theoretically a different species now. Uh, at one point, it was a lady or variety or subspecies or something like that, um, attenuata. So, so um, like I said, I've been talking uh, mostly about, uh, or you might commonly know the Aspidistra eladior um, as being the common one. And there's been a lot of different selections made of that over the, the uh, decades. And uh, so th that's the one you're gonna find in the most variety of. But um, some of the history with that plant is it's from Southern Japan in uh, reality. And, and apparently in the wild, it's associated with um, trees which include, going back the last month, Ardesia ciborii, which apparently is a, a tree species of Ardesia, and Castanopsis ciborii, which is a kind of evergreen oak. So it's in these evergreen forests uh, as an understory plant is where that actually grows. So it can take, and those tend to be really dark, you know, dark evergreen forest. Um, so uh, the ladiers, it's not surprising that they do well in, uh, in the house. And a ladier became popular in, in Europe uh, in the 1800s. Uh, suppose, I was reading online and there's not, like I said, not a lot of information out there on specifics, but supposedly I saw anywhere from 1820 to 1830s is when it was brought to Britain. Uh, the Dutch had brought it back from um, Southeast Asia. And then they started growing them in, uh, in homes in England. And the thing was, um, at that time period in the 1800s, most people didn't grow houseplants. Um, houses weren't really accommodating at that point uh, for houseplants, nothing would survive. You had, if you had light uh, lights, they were probably gas lights and the fumes from them and uh, were, I mean, bad for us, but uh, also for the plants, uh, there would be soot that would form on all the surfaces in the houses from when they actually used the gas lights, apparently. Um, and uh, most plants would just up and die. Um, but there were two that they figured, figured out that they could actually grow in England. Uh, the Kentia palm and Aspidistria ladier would survive and, uh, and grow in the dark houses. Uh, so they were some of the first house plants being grown in uh, Europe uh, in the 1800s during mainly the Victorian period. So uh, that's when they became popular and they were quite popular in England in particular, uh, from the late 1800s into the middle of the 19, uh, or into the, yeah, into the mid 1900s. So, um, and a popular thing to do was, once photography came about, was to get your picture taken with your Aspidistra. So there's pictures, and you can go online, you can find this, uh, people posing with their Aspidistra in their house on a stand. Uh, and uh, it, it was a popular thing to do then. And it was uh, seen as to have that house plant was saying you're in the middle class, more or less. It was a class thing. Uh, I mean, you, were, you weren't downright poor if you were able to have an Aspidistra actually in your house. Um, uh, it was a class, class thing. So um, you, got to be, you were proud to have that Aspidistra in there and have something you could grow green in your house, along with the gas lights that were killing you uh, and everything else in your house. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so going back to that, uh, in England during the war, World War II, uh, there was a song and a couple books that were written with Aspidistra. The book I can't remember, but it was an Orwell book. Um, and it talks about the dystopian things as or Orwell did. So and I didn't quite, I didn't read it. I just saw a reference to it and I did not look to see how it was really um, uh, pertained to them, but it was about that, the class in the, you know, that uh, class thing of 
the middle class, I guess. And so, but there was also a song written, which was kind of, it had some various verses. It's the, let's see, I have to look at me. The biggest aspidistra in the world. And if you go online, you can find recordings of this. Um, there was this woman who would sing it. Uh, and there's, I heard, I listened to one version. It only did one or two verses. Apparently there's some really um, interesting verses that go to it pertaining to Hitler. So, uh, but it was, uh, the Aspidistras uh, were familiar to all the, the soldiers. Their family would have, you know, you had your Aspidistra at home and that was a familiar thing. So having a song about an Aspidistra was kind of a, a good thing during World War II. So, um, and of course, those were the Aspidistra late years. So, that's enough about the history of, uh, a little bit of the history anyways, of Eladier. Um, so I'll show you a few different forms of Eladier that we have here in the garden. Um, and the first one, um, oh, actually, I'm gonna dig down through here. I have, I have leaves, I have uh, actually entire plants, but I'm gonna start with one that's down in here. This one might not show it too much, but um, I'll actually clear my board here and uh, let me see here. Where did I throw my cup? Here's my cup. Let me get this stuff out of the way real quick so that this is easier for um, Alexander to focus in on. And you might be able to see more than if I just hold the plant up. So, uh, get rid of some of my props. I have too many. Anyways, the first one I'm going to show you here is an, a rather old cultivar called Ecobano. And what's significant about Ecobano is it has, I don't know if you can see it here, there's typically a stripe down the middle of the leaf. It's a broad, um, broad leafed uh, eladier um, with like a simple yellowish green stripe. Um, it's one of the larger growing ones. They, I mean, some of the elaters can get up over three feet tall. And actually, eladier means tall, from what I understand, um, basically. And I forgot, I was going to look up the meaning of aspidistra, and I saw that the other day, but I didn't write it down. Oh, uh, but Eladier is tall. So it's one of the, the, it's a large growing one, as you can see actually here on the Lenin song over here. And I think, I don't know the origins of Lenin song, but which is this one right, excuse me, right over here, this big clump, but it has a very similar leaf in reality to uh, um, Ecobano. It has, again, it has a central uh, stripe down the middle, and there are some axillary stripes on there too, I guess you might say at times. Um, I think it's kind of more or less an improved form of Ecobano, but I don't know the actual uh, history on that plant. So uh, another one I'm going to show you here is one that's been around for quite some time, and this is a bit more variegated. It has a little bit more uh, irregular variegation. This is Okame. And, but it's much more extreme. You can see um, cream to white variegation on it, and it, it's throughout more of the leaf. Um, this is one, it readily self sows, and there's actually a seedling right here. And I can't tell if this one has any striping yet on it, but it looks like it might have a spot. Um, but you can also see on this, on both of these now, I can show you there's, there's forming fruit down here, and if you look very closely, I don't know if Alexander can see where I'm pointing, there's the formation of new flower buds on these. Uh, the eladiers flower during the, the winter for us. So uh, it's, of course, crawling down there on the ground on the cold winter day uh, is, uh, everyone does that, right? You know, two inches from, the, with, with your nose, two inches from the ground underneath the foliage. That's when those are gonna be flowering, is late winter. Uh, so they're not often seen, but uh, you can see the fruit here. Uh, and you can see more or less where the ground level was uh, on these. So, uh, so going back to Akame, apparently in oh, the early 2000s, someone collected or a seedling from one of our Akame in our lath house is what I was reading. And um, this is some foliage from that. And this is one that is actually out near our parking lot. It's very inconsistent, though the best, these are some of the best leaves I found, which had really nice streaking, um, but they also have spots. Um, so I'm wondering if it hybridized with another one we have, uh, which I'll show you next. Um, so this is a seedling from Okame apparently. So this is another one, Hoshizara, which has spots. So that's why I wonder if it, it got mixed up. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
they weren't growing too far from each other in the lath house, if I remember correctly, originally. So um, a lot of Aspidistra actually have spots on them and they aren't quite sure why they have spots, much like a Cuba. Why do a Cubas have spots? Is it making um, things, uh, or making animals think that they're uh, virused or something, so you might not want to eat them or the leaves are starting to die? Don't know. Uh, Oh, and before I get that question, apparently deer and rabbits will eat Aspidistra. <laughs> Voles, I know, do too. They'll eat the roots out from underneath them. I've had that happen. Um, so anyways, uh, those are a couple. So we have Hoshizara with the spots. I have this, this mixed uh, seedling we have, uh, which spots and stripes. And we have uh, Okame, which is an old, really good um, variegated one. There's a whole bunch of other selections. Ippen is one uh, that's a really good variegated one. Tony Avent has a whole selection of them if you look at Plant Delights Nursery or in their reference um, uh, page for Aspidistra, if you can dig and find it. I couldn't find it yesterday, but uh, Dennis was able to get me the link because Dennis actually wrote a lot of the text on it uh, when he was working at Plant Delight. So. Um, he knew where to find it. But um, there's a lot of variation uh, and available forms of Eladier. Um, it's being the most common. But probably uh, one of the more common ones that you'll find of Eladier is one called Asahi, which has a bit of a different variegation than the, uh, the previous ones I've shown you. It has this white splash up on the top of the leaf. Um, Recently moved or planted plants often don't show their characteristic real well. It improves as the plant settles in. Uh, and so, but Asahi has been here in the garden for decades and decades. We have a lot of it out near the winter garden and we have it uh, in a couple other parts in the garden, but it's a good tried and true one. It seems to be a little less vigorous uh, than uh, Hoshizara and, uh, and, oh darn, what's the, Okame, which are both really big. Um, it's been a, a two, and a, a two to two and a half footer, while the Hoshizara and Akabano three, even maybe more than three feet sometimes. So, but similar to Akame is a newer selection, which I'll show you here. This is Snowcap, um, which has a much more strong uh, white uh, on the top of that leaf. It goes way down through the, the leaf blade. So it has not been as strong of a grower. Oh, we just had a hawk fly through. Yeah, uh, <laughs> in the background there. But anyways, um, so this is one, it's a newer improved form of Asahi. And as I'm looking at it here, it does have a few stars on it as well. It has a few spots on it. So, uh, well, I don't get that on uh, Akame. So anyways, that's most of what I'll show you about um, Eladier. So a few other ones we have are, actually, I'm gonna just go right over here since, um, it's right here, and I have a sample of this one, but, and I'll show you the label. Uh, this is, let's see if I say it right, Ebenensis uh, Flowing Fountain. Ebenensis is, um, it's, a, when, it's found in Sichuan, China. Uh, so, uh, but this is a really good species for us here. Um, and this is a selection that, um, uh, called Flowing Fountain, like I said, and it's one that Hayes Jackson, uh, a plantsman from um, Anniston, South, or, uh, Alabama, brought back um, from the Wuhan Botanic Garden uh, several years ago. And it's, um, he shared it, and Tony's brought this one in propagation, and we have big clumps of this. It's been a, an excellent form. Uh, it's kind of, it's not totally upright. Uh, it wants to kind of gracefully flow as its name kind of flowing fountain. It wants to um, droop to one side. Uh, it, it's been very vigorous. I have a big clump of this over near the steps going up um, uh, past the, uh, the McSwain Center, but this is another clump that I have here uh, that we got going. It's been quite vigorous, very hardy, no issues at all growing for us here. Uh, it has spots on it as well. They're not as distinct as uh, some other ones you will see later on, but it does have a really nice distinct habit. The leaves are much thinner than that of the um, a lady ears. Here I'll show you in comparison. I'll hold up a piece of Asahi. You can see Asahi is probably about four, four and a half inches wide, um, but the leaves on these are say one and a half to two inches uh, wide on the um, Ebenensis uh, in this case. And 
the blade goes down the petiole a lot further, so you don't have as distinct of a leaf petiole on these as much as you do on the Elatiers. So, we're going to go into some other ones I have here. This is one that's actually not hardy here for us, uh, but it's a really interesting species. Um, and I will s uh, clear out my board here just to set it on so it might be a hair easier to see. Um, I don't know if that'll help or not. We'll see. This is Aspidistra grandiflora. And you might ask, what is grandiflora about it? Uh, the flower on this one, supposedly, I have not seen one, I've seen pictures, looks like a five inch spider. It has very long, instead of where the lobes were on um, the flowers, it, it's very elongated out and it looks kind of like spider's legs. Uh, and they're up to five inches across. So there's your granda flora, so big flower. Um, it's a tropical species, and so won't survive outside for us, but it could be a really good houseplant uh, in our climate. So let's grow that one uh, in there. So, and it is originally found growing on karst limestone outcrops in Vietnam. So it's, uh, it, it doesn't need an acid soil, and that's a, oh, talking about growing conditions, um, uh, a lot of things like Elatier, um, very drought tolerant, very, it will take cool conditions, it will take warm conditions, it's not picky at all as long as it's not, it's above zero, more or less. Um, and it'll grow indoors or outdoors as long as it's not in full blazing sun, um, but ideally shade. Uh, well, uh, this is probably one, it, this one's probably quite drought tolerant, I would guess being on, growing on karst, uh, very well drained conditions. And it's, like I said, limey soils, uh, much less than uh, you're going to find uh, probably much more organic soils growing underneath a, um, the uh, uh, Castanopsis and Ardesia where uh, the Elatier grows in the wild. So conditions are a little bit different, but shade being the key thing there. And most people have shade in their house. I think I had too much light in my apartment. I've killed some, but not of these. Um, anyways, that's Grandiflora. And it has, it has decent spotting on this one. And this is one called Big Spotty uh, that uh, was selected um, from them. So anyways, one that I need to keep an eye out for maybe. I'll get some flowers this winter. Who knows? Um, and I believe, when's it flower? No, this one flowers in the spring, early summer, if I remember right. Did I put that? Yeah, early summer. So June-ish is when that one typically would flower. So let's see who I have next on, next on my list. This one's a little bit different. I wanted to give you some, uh, uh, what actually, some variety um, here. This is one, uh, this is, now the name has changed. What other name I have on here? We had Longifolia on this, but now it is being called a Hynainensis or Hainanensis. So it's from Southern China into Hainan uh, Island in uh, Southern China, off the coast of China, over near Hong Kong, you know. Anyways, uh, and this is Quan Ba, I guess maybe how you say that, Q-U-A-N Ba, B-A. Um, so it's Southern China. It's a tender selection for us here in this area. If you get into zone eight B, nine uh, A, it's probably uh, much more stable. You could probably grow this one right up next to the foundation of your house and be uh, okay. It needs a really sheltered spot, but it can get three and a half, four feet tall. And the leaves on this are about at most an inch across. And um, our plant here is not the prettiest, I will say that, but We've been torturing it as you do with Aspidistras and being that they're cast iron. We've been torturing it in our nursery. It has never been a bright gr or dark green. It's always been uh, a pale green for us. Uh, it could be that it's high light intensity. I don't know. Um, it might want some denser shade, but you know, uh, a zone nine plant um, and it prefers a little bit more moisture. It grows in moist ravines uh, and forest in Southern China and uh, Hainan Island. So a little bit different. Like I said, it does not have the broad leaves, again, that you get with the more typical Aspidistra elatier. So they aren't all like this. Uh, let's see here. Who do I have next on my list? Okay, Nagayo stars, which is um, actually behind um, Alexander, but I have a sample over here too somewhere. Uh, let's see. We have big clumps of this in the garden. This is Nagayo stars, which has been excellent for us. It's a wonderful grower. Um, 
It has really good spotting uh, on the leaves, uh, cream. And the leaves again on this one, they're about an inch and a half to two inches wide. Kind of, uh, it's a uh, stronger uh, spotting on this one than on the uh, Ebenensis that we had earlier, uh, Flowing Fountain. And this has a little bit more upright habit. We've had this one in the garden, even through 2018, it was not phased when we had um, between three and five degrees. It was not phased at all, as with the Ebenensis, uh, it was really good. Um, so uh, if you look closely, you can see some of the fruit on here again, uh, down at the base on this. But um, this is a, a little bit taller grown uh, than the flowing fountain. It's up to like 30 inches, I think, yeah. Uh, and again, it's from Southern uh, China and it grows in moist forest uh, there. But I have it growing in partial sun and it's done okay since it lost its, uh, we took a tree down right next to our other clump. No, wait, I take that back. Um, that was that one, Never mind. Uh, but th this one will take a fair amount of uh, sun as well. It's a darker green to me than um, Ebenensis. Uh, so, but it's, uh, this is Oblancifolia. And I, so that it's referring to the shape of the leaf and I'm terrible with my specifics, uh, 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 prefixes and suffixes uh, or prefixes in this case, it's Oblanza. Uh, <laughs> and I don't remember what that ob, part refers to. So it's, it's dealing with the shape of the leaf though. Um, but Nagayo stars has just been a really good one uh, for us in the garden. And it's right behind Alexander here. He might be, he, I think he's gonna turn around slowly. So hopefully you won't get motion sickness as you look at uh, Blake. Uh, uh, and it is being highlighted by the sun here this afternoon, coming through the trees here, the filtered sun. Uh, so that is Nagayo stars. And while Alexander uh, gets, shows you that clump, I will get another plant here, another one, let's see. Oh, okay, this is a bit different. We're gonna go, again, this is a totally different looking one. You might question that it's an Aspidistra. <laughs> and I will get my standard Eladier foliage here so you can see again. Uh, variation, how different than this one is. It's, uh, this is Aspidistra omiensis completed. And there's several forms of omiensis that have become a, available too, but this is one that we have in the garden. Um, but they are very thin leafed ones. And the leaf uh, blade goes almost the whole way down the leaf petiole, unlike on Eladier, which you can see here, which has about almost eight to 10 inches of petiole in this case, and I probably didn't get the complete petiole. Um, so um, you can see a uh, bit difference in height. This is probably, uh, oh, here, actually I should go. This is more like, uh, the height of the Eladier is going way up there. So this is probably about a 24 incher. Yep. Uh, with one inch leaf blades uh, on this species here on Omiensis. So uh, in this case is Mount, or uh, completed. Uh, Omiensis refers to Mount Ome or Ime uh, in, in Southeastern China. Mark has collected there, I believe, or near there anyways. There's a lot of plants that come from that uh, area, um, but it's not only found in there, it's found in most of Shes or parts of Sichuan, China is where this one is from. But it has long, thin, strap-like leaves, and it's found in rich, humus, rich uh, uh, forest uh, in that area. So, but like I said, this one looks a bit different uh, it's, it's almost more like a liriope looking, uh, giant liriope looking plant or Ophiopogon. So now we're going to get into a species again that I have a couple different uh, forms of, and there's more of them out there. So, um, and it is Aspidistra uh, Szechuanensis. So I wonder where it's from. Southeastern China, including Szechuan <laughs> in this case. So, um, we have a couple different forms of that here and I will bring them in. I have some both potted as well as I have a division of one too. So, um, and this one here and this one here. And so earlier on the first plant, I think that um, uh, Alexander was showing you pointing out with uh, before we started this afternoon was this one here. Um, this is Aspidistra um, um 
darn, I'm blanking. Um, spectacular. spectacular, yes, thank you. I have it on here somewhere. But in this one's native haunts, it grows in uh, the forest and bamboo groves and thickets uh, in Southeast Asia, including Szechuan. Uh, there's some variation in the hardiness of the species, as I will point out on uh, a couple of these here. Um, but anyways, the first one is spectacular, and it is a great one in the garden. Uh, it has long leaves, heavily spotted, uh, and they tend to arch out. I don't know if you can remember back or if um, Alexander can pan slowly over to the clump over that direction uh, again. Uh, hey, I'm giving Alexander a challenge here. So what? Uh, anyways. So anyways, it, this, this this spectacular has been spectacular for us here, and it is a t rather tall one, growing oh, probably two and a half to three feet tall is what I would suggest. Uh, yeah, 32 inches. So that's two and a half, uh, almost to three feet. So uh, heavily spotted, really great grower for us here. It's a selection, I believe, um, darn, blanking his name. Oh, Nurseries Caroliniana. Um, and I didn't put it down here. Anyways, he brought it back um, from China and I know him. Anyways, it'll hit me later on. But, uh, and it's a spectacular selection, very strong grower, like I said. Another one that, um, that we have that's been a really good grower, I don't have it currently in the garden, but we had it in the garden through 2008. We dug, or 18, I should say, when it was really nasty and cold. Uh, and it's a selection Mark made um, called um, Dappled Expectations. And this one has a totally different spotting pattern to it. It has a spot and then there's like a halo around the spot. And I'm hoping you can see that on this. We have been, this is uh, one of his select, Mark's selections, and we've been trying to bump it up, and we divided heavily our clump. And so, like I said, I don't have it in the garden right now, but we had it in the, uh, at the entrance to the, or the Lath House for a couple years, and it was doing excellent there, and it had these really cool leaves. And I believe um, Blake might be able to bring up a picture of the original plant in the wild, and... Um, I forget where in China. Uh, <laughs> oh wait, I have it down here somewhere. Uh, no, I did not, or yes I did. No, I didn't. I didn't put where it came from in China, but it's, Mark collected it in China in 2014. Um, but dappled expectations, and do you have it up then? I do. It's okay. the picture in the background, everybody, not okay. the one in the foreground, but it's. it's yeah, the exactly. The there's some branches in the, the foreground, and then there's the, the Aspidistra in the background. But it's a really nice selection. We've really been impressed with this one. It's tall growing, uh, just like spectacular, but a very different spotting pattern. Um, uh, on that as well. So the one after this is the one I was saying, there's some variation in hardiness and it's this one here, which I find really cool. And Tony Avent uh, mentions this one, it's called rawhide, very thick leaves and it's a much more compact plant. He, suge if I have, he suggests it grows to about 20 inches, but it's only hardy about reliably real top hardy to zone 8b. So even the last couple years we've gotten damage on ours in the garden when we've had mild winters. If we have a hard winter it takes it totally to the ground and it has to come back up. But the leaves on this are much more rounded to me and there is a slight, if I really feel it, you, on the um, Dappled expectations, there's a slight serration to the edge of the leaf, and I probably can feel it lightly on, maybe on um, spectacular, but it's, you, it's almost rough on the edges of the leaves on this, and it's very thick. Spectacular's very thin uh, leaf form, and uh, the dappled expectations, it's a little thicker, but this is very thick. Um, it's quite different. Um, but this one, I'd say definitely a great house plant or in a sheltered spot here in the Raleigh area. We have it here in Asian Valley. Like I said, though, it often get, it typically gets damaged um, through um, the winter. So, um, so we're getting there. I'm, uh, so, but that was one that had a couple different clones, but zone 8B is solid for that. But um, that's, we've been having that the last couple winters, but if we have a hard winter, it could be uh, taken back really bad. So let me see, who do I have here now? Oh, I have a couple smaller growing ones here. Um, 
And this is one, uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, this is one back here. This is another subtropical one, subcordata. Um, and this is a selection called uh, Mr. Uh, Jiu, which I guess is the person they bought it from in Thailand, in a nursery in Thailand. Uh, it's a spotted one. This would be a good house plant. Uh, and is it tropical? It said zone 9A is what Tony's suggesting for that one. So a little on the tender side for us, but makes a really good pot plant long term. Supposedly it gets, it doesn't get real tall and it's flares out the leaves into a, an irregular nest looking uh, habit. So a um, little bit different. It has a paler green with uh, spotting on it. Um, so just an interesting one to grow again as a house plant. And that's sub, uh, Saburata, Subro, Subrotata, I should say. S-U-B-R-O-T-A-T. -T. Oh, and I have it somewhere here. And Alexander's going to try to zoom in on that. I'll let it flip up there. Um, so that's a little bit on the shorter side. Let's see what I, else I have here. And I didn't, there's a couple I have here. And when I, there's some of Mark's collections. And the next one I'm going to do here is one of Mark's collections. So, and I just have a few leaves of this one, but it's one I find really cool. And, um, so this is uh, Aspidistra zongbei, uh, and this is a striped and spotted form that Mark collected. And it's only in the garden, it only gets about six or eight inches tall. It kind of goes horizontal, um, and I hope you can see the leaves on it. I really find this one, I like this one. Um, it has, it's a much different habit. Again, like I said, it might be eight, six to eight inches tall. It's low and spreading. Um, it has a uh, fairly elongated rhizome, so it's, a lot of the Zongbiensis, uh, which I, there's uh, several of them uh, available. There's like Moon is in the name on a lot of them, and I can't think of them right now. But anyways, um, they uh, are a very different habit. Again, you know, three uh, plus feet on some of the ladiers, six to eight inches on this one. Uh, it has a similar low leaf shape to the ladiers. So let's see here. I think... This might be my last one that I have here now. And this is another one Mark collected a few years ago. And this one's a similar habit to, um, to the Zongbiensis, but a little bit different to me. Uh, and this is one, he, he doesn't have a species on it. And it just says relatively large. And I think that's relative uh, because they don't seem real large to me. Pale spots. Uh, it does have some pale spots on it, but this is again about an eight to 10 inch tall one. And we've had this in the lath house for several years now, and it is forming a decent sized clump and I am liking it. It has a blossom on it here, um, which was interesting too. Uh, but uh, again, it's a relatively low growing one, not anything like Eladier again. Great pot plants for all these though. So that is mostly what I have. And hopefully I haven't bored anybody to death on Aspidistra, but um, we really actually have probably ten, uh, eight or 10 different uh, ones that uh, species and or unknown ones that we have in the garden at least, um, uh, or in the nursery that I didn't even talk about. So uh, we're still figuring out what will grow here. Tony Avent though has a really good, um, uh, is a really good information source on these. For the United States, he's probably has the, he's probably the biggest collection. Uh, there's the biggest collection Dennis has told me is at a garden somewhere in uh, Germany and they don't share anything. So it's like, they won't give any of them away. They won't let anybody have any of their germplasm. So. Uh, unlike us here at, at uh, the Arboretum and at Plant Delights, we like to get things out there. These are ones who like to hoard things. So um, those collections are uh, more or less inaccessible, unfortunately. But, um, but Tony has a wonderful collection and a wonderful resource online if you want to find out about a lot of these, whether they're purchasable or not. So. Okay. I hope I, uh, like I said, I didn't bore anybody to death yeah. with the dry topic of Aspidistra, cast iron plant. Well, we got a few questions. Okay. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat now. I can ask them. Uh, but so somebody was asking about hardiness zones for Elatior. Elatior, a solid zone 7A. Uh -huh. uh, you might even risk it and go as far as 6 B, but that would be really risky. It would have to be in a really sheltered location because zero is about the, the extent for most of them. So. Are there any Aspidistra species that tolerate colder climates better? Uh, Eladier is probably your best at this best point. Best bet. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, somebody was asking, do they tolerate sandy soils? Um, they typically want some organic matter. I mean, you can probably, I mean, they grow them on the coastal plain. Um, I mean, lady or anyways, it's very widely planted. Um, I mean, extensively planted along the, uh, the east coast of the United States, down through Savannah and Charleston. They use it everywhere along uh, Louisiana, the Gulf Coast states. So I'm assuming those are probably pretty sandy soils uh, in those areas. But they would prefer to have some amending. But again, they are uh, fairly resilient. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Wouldn't want to put them in pure sand. But, uh, sure. Yeah. Okay, so Aspidistra omiensis completed. Yep. Do the leaves stand straight up or does it bend over? It's slightly relaxed, uh, but it's it's not terribly. I mean, it's it's not as oh, uh, it's not like these low growing ones, but it, it probably um, I think it's probably a twenty inch one. Let me see here. Tony says about a twenty four inches tall, so it's fairly tall and upright, um, though the the sides will um, be relaxed. Cool. Um, and somebody pointed out in the chat, Ted Stevens. Yes, thank you. Ted Stevens is where Spectacular <laughs> came from. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And it looks like that is all the questions we have today. Okay. So thank you, Tim, for talking to us about Aspidistra. It was not boring. There's still a, a good number of people here with us. <laughs> <laughs> and we definitely were exposed to lots of really cool plants. I will point out the, uh, the analogy you made between the seeds looking like old teeth. Uh -huh. Very spot on, very disturbing. Yes, so, yes. especially you. for Halloween. You know, it's October. Oh, okay. You yeah, know. perfect. And so is perfect. No Instead complaints. of, you know, what, what was it? Do you put <laughs> grapes in, uh, in something to have, and make eyeballs for the kids? Oh, and, yeah. Like, Instead, you can have there these. There you go. You know, tea, uh, uh, or the, the sample of there tea. There you things. go. So you came here yeah. to learn about yeah. plants, and now you're getting Halloween decorating tips. Yeah. So perfect. Go dig underneath your Aspidistra ladier and see if you can find <laughs> anything. It's easier said than done. Awesome. Okay. Well, <laughs> Might be easier to go to the, the cemetery and dig up a body and get the teeth there. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Oh, jeez. All right. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us, everybody, for our midweek program this week. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about Japanese maples. We'll be doing a garden conversations with Jim and Lynn Swanson and our dear curator, Dennis Carey, talking about Japanese maples. So please join us for that. We'll see you all next time. Take care.